All right, it is 3.30 and we are ready to get started. Uh, welcome to the Indiana Arts Homecoming and you're in the session access. You have questions, we have answers. And this is uh, going to be more of a Q&A session with the, a few members of the IAC's Accessibility in the Arts Advisory Committee. And we're so thankful to have our three experts here today to chat with us um, to go over questions of access. Just as a note for housekeeping stuff, um, you can keep yourself muted in the beginning just while we're going over a few basic uh, things about accessibility and then we'll open it up. You know, when we invite you to, to unmute yourself, please feel free to chime in. We'll have a discussion time or use the chat box, whatever feels better to you. Ask us questions. Um, we're here to do Q&A. Um, also, we do have live captions. If you want to turn on subtitles in Zoom, down below in the menu bar, there's a subtitle option. You also have ASL interpretation if you want to pin that video to keep it on your screen. Okay, so before we get started, I think it's great to kind of warm up and get to know each other in these sessions instead of just launching into the information. So anyone who's here, all the attendees, Will you please put your name and your location and maybe your occupation, like your organization in the chat box? Let us know that you're here. Let us know um, who we are talking to, your name, where you're from, um, maybe what organization you're with or what your art artistry is. Who's here? Who's here? Oh, okay. We've got an art museum person. Yay. Anna. Anne is from uh, Southern Indiana. She runs an art gallery, art council. They do it all. IU Cinema. Hey. The Humanities Council. All right, more museum people, the New Harmony Project, theater people in the house. Welcome all of you. Could you Fort Wayne, visual and performing arts. Uh, it's so good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. So when to get started, um, I'm going to set some context, give some background on what this session is going to be about. We're going to, the outcomes we're hoping to have today is to learn about the ADA, the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, and accessibility basics. We're going to have everybody consider how your work can be more inclusive of people with disabilities. We're going to gain some new ideas on how to be accessible. And the way we're going to do this is first, we're going to give some background on ADA. We're going to ask the panel some questions about accommodations. And then we're going to open it up for Q&A from all of you. That's kind of how it's going to flow. A what, is, what does ADA stand for? Chris, did I say it right? American with Disability Act. Why am I doubting myself right now? Chad? Sorry, uh, sorry. Okay, I'm here. I was looking for my mute, my mute button. No, yeah, you're correct. It's the Americans with Disabilities Act. Americans with Disabilities Act. I yep. felt like one of my words was off, but thank you. Thanks for sure. making me feel better about that. Just, just a, a point of note. This is the uh, 35th year, actually. So uh, it's been around for for a bit, but um, yeah, it's celebrating kind of a, a big birthday this year. Thank you. Um, while we're talking with Chad, let's do some introductions while you're unmuted, Chad. Will you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Chad Crow. I'm the Deputy Director of the Indiana Governor's Council for People with Disabilities. It's our state's Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, not a lot of people have heard of us. Well, um, 
we've got sort of like a small universe of people that we work with, um, but kind of the, the, the impact and the work we do is pretty broad. We um, uh, work on systems change and advocacy uh, and um, research and developing pilot projects to kind of improve um, the everyday uh, life and quality outcomes for people with disabilities in Indiana. Thanks so much. Michelle, will you introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Michelle Fanfare Sturry, and I am the coordinator at the Redbird Art Studio at Cardinal Services in uh, Warsaw, Indiana. Um, the portion of the um, of Cardinal that I work with um, is an adult day service program that, um, like I said, works with adults um, with uh, all sorts of intellectual and um, uh, developmental needs and um, yeah I run the uh, art studio and um, it's a really fun lively place that mixes up the arts and people. Great and let's have Chris Johnson introduce herself. Hi I'm Chris I'm the director of the Indiana Deaf History Museum at the Scope of the Deaf um, I'm also involved in different projects when people need, need um, some advice, they, other museum people in town usually will shoot me an email. Um, I've been on a committee for the Indi Indiana Disability History Project also, um, and on this committee. So I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Wonderful. And I'm Stephanie Haynes. I am the Arts Education and Accessibility Program Manager at the Indiana Arts Commission. So a little bit of context for access. Access is a broad term used to describe considering and eliminating the barriers some people face when approaching your work. At the IAC, we use the word access as part of our IDEA acronym, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. So this broad definition of access uh, can sometimes mean strategies like lowering prices to eliminate financial barriers, or a strategy could be to change locations or go online to remove the barrier of transportation for people without access to transportation. Those are great ways to increase access for certain groups of people, but often and today, this term means access for people with disabilities or accessibility. And that's a specific group we're talking about today in regards to access. Accessibility for people with disabilities. But even this is a broad category and we will get into that a little more later. Um, let's get into a few of the basics about accessibility. So I borrowed a lot of this content from Chris Johnson, her slideshow that she does, she has a great presentation uh, for museums on inclusion and access. So I encourage you to follow up with Chris if you uh, would like an even more in-depth presentation. Um, but so we have this information here that says 20% of people in the United States have a disability and that's a conservative number. I think you should probably think that a quarter of the people in your community may have a disability. So they are in our communities. People with disabilities are people in our communities, and um, they're an important piece of our of the work that we do. I want to ask our panel to talk a little bit about how broad the disability community app is. Um, I'm looking here at temporary disability and other types of disability categories. Um, Chad, do you want to talk a little bit about the broad scope of the disability community and how it, it also has intersectionality? Sure. Um, well, so, so really disability, you know, it's important to remember that disability is really just a, a natural part of the human condition. That it's it's something that um, most of us will end up experiencing at some point in our life. Um, there, there, there's a statistic that's kind of thrown around, and some people kind of take issue with it. But um, it's 
it's that 80 percent of people will have a disability at some point in their in their life um it, and and that kind of goes you know shows um that as we you know we go through you know from from birth to um to death right um we have conditions of aging uh and we have those conditions that you know you generally associate with um just being older mobility mobility issues might be hearing things like that uh, you know a lot of those individuals tend not to think of themselves as having a disability but really i mean they're they're within the same sort of universe of of um, the, you know, of people that we're talking about um it, it, disability does cut through a lot of um the intersections of life i mean um race gender um diversity you know you know, cultural cultural diversity um you know it, it, it's really for some people uh it, it's a it's a really important part of their their identity other people um it's more of a kind of a muted characteristic but um nonetheless it's it's it's, it's very important for us to to be aware of um you know these are our friends and neighbors and that um they're uh, it, 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 and when we can provide them with uh, accommodations and, and access um, so that they can better participate and contribute and uh, take advantage of all the, the wonderful things that we, you know, that we sometimes take, take for granted, um, you know, it's, it's a really good thing. Thank you. Um, Chris or Michelle, do you guys have anything you'd like to add? N no. Okay. So again, just setting the background for the ADA, I want to talk about barriers. We want to, um, these are important phrases from the ADA that we want to talk about today. Um, one being equal opportunity to benefit and the other being read readily achievable barrier removal. They kind of are phrases that seem like, um, how do I apply these? But so we're going to get a little bit into that. Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about equal opportunity to benefit? Sure. Um, okay, so equal opportunity to benefit doesn't necessarily have to mean that everybody has the same experience. It just means that any person should be able to approach and use the things that are offered in any kind of program or activities going on at your organization. And it also means that any person should be able to join in. Um, you know, and again, accessibility can be scary because if, you, you know, if you're not an expert in you know, different medical conditions, disability categories, you think, well, how am I gonna make all of my programs exactly the same for everybody who shows up? And that's not really the point. The point is that anybody who shows up should be able to be involved in some way. So sometimes that will just be removing a physical barrier. Sometimes it means offering a sign language interpreter. Uh, sometimes it means, you know, offering activities on the first floor and the second floor instead of just the second floor, um, things like that. Thank you so much. So we also have the other phrase, readily achievable barrier removal. So we want to identify barriers that prevent equal access, and that includes the space, the physical space, and your programming. So, and, and with many things in the ADA, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but readily achievable uh, barrier removal includes things like providing ramps, um, repositioning shelves or counters, bathroom modifications, lowering, um, paper towel holders, things like that. And there's a, there's a long list. Um, these are some categories of barriers. Chris, do you want to explain these a little more? Okay, okay. so um, again, the thought of trying to figure out what all the different kinds of disabilities are that exist in the world. Um, instead, it's better to focus on the types of barriers because we can change those. We can't change a person's physical condition, but we can change the environment and change the way that we offer programs. So 
uh, physical barriers are the easiest things uh, to identify. And they're the things that prevent people from entering a space and interacting with uh, what's going on, what you have to offer. Uh, communication barriers, the obvious, you know, people with, uh, who are deaf or hard of hearing, people who are blind or have low vision. Uh, I also kind of like to include people on the autism spectrum or sensory processing uh, disorders because they don't receive and respond, you know, physical st uh, stimulus the same way, you know, sights and sounds. So people can be overstimulated or not react to things. Uh, so those uh, barriers are a little bit tougher sometimes to navigate because they can be invisible also. Uh, attitudinal and behavioral barriers are the things that really prevent inclusion from happening. They prevent people from having positive interactions uh, when they want to engage in whatever kinds of activities and programs that your, your organization offers. Um, so it's things like not making eye contact with the person who has a disability and just speaking to their caregiver, uh, you know, trying, taking away a white cane from a blind person. Um, you know, I've seen examples where uh, the, the person at the uh, guest services desk actually insisted that a blind person leave their cane at the desk, and that's not appropriate because it's almost like a part of their own body and how they navigate. So it's uh, kind of the own stereotypes and lack of information and misunderstandings that we all have that can affect how we behave towards people with disabilities. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to add this note because I get this question a lot from grantees of the IAC. Does the ADA require barrier, barrier removal in historic buildings? And the answer is yes, if it is readily achievable. So just because you're hosting your chamber music in a historic building doesn't mean you, you don't need to still be um, accessible to your community. Um, However, there are some caveats on historic structures and making profound changes to them. This is, I just wanted to show that the ADA has these types of examples on their website, um, ada.gov, and then you can search for these specific answers. Like in this one, it gives the illustration of when it would be uh, architecturally significant element of the building and when it would not be um, making a, a removing a barrier or changing part of the programming. Um, so I'm not going to read all this, but these um, examples exist. They're easy to kind of Google and find your answers. Is Stephanie, can and so I to just, wrap up our, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So, you know, um, you were talking about readily achievable um, access. Um, what was it? What was the, um, I lost the term. Uh, readily, barrier readily removal. Yeah. Barrier removal, right? And, and so that, that's that's there's this mis misconception that accommodations and um, you know access changes are are going to be cost prohibitive or be um, a burden or uh, administrative issue for most organizations or businesses. And really, that's not true. Most um, most accommodations that uh, pe that really uh, have the most benefit for people. Um, cost very little. So, so often they don't cost anything at all, and it's just a matter of changing uh, policies or procedures or practices. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, it does cost, you know, anywhere between a couple hundred dollars or five hundred dollars. But um, the, the the value is um, often, you know, far greater than just that dollar amount. And I just wanted to add one last thing about the historical buildings. Um, you know, even if they're even if you're in a situation where the um, ADA doesn't necessarily uh, impose a, um, a, an obligation for you to change um, your structure or your space because of um, certain characteristics about your historical building, that doesn't mean that um, you shouldn't be considering um, finding alternate ways to, pr you know, provide your service outside of that building. So, um, you know, it's just, I, I think access uh, isn't necessarily thought of uh, as as uh, individuals coming to you, sometimes you have to go to them. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Chad. Great point. Um, we're gonna get, well, there's a question later about budgets and how to be accessible and how much money to spend. So thank you for teeing that right up. 
And um, I agree, the historic building thing, there are many ways, this is usually how I counsel people who ask me about having a program in a historic building, is that there are more ways to be accessible than just adding an elevator, right? The basic um, entrance physical space. So thank you so much. And this is just to wrap up the slides for now. Um, just wanted to say, keep in mind that there are usually multiple solutions to accommodations. And like Chad said, there can be free solutions. There can be um, some simple solutions all the way up, scaled up to some big changes you can make. Think beyond the entrance. So not just how people will enter your building, but also how they will interact with the programming you're providing. Planning ahead, always a good idea. Do you know how you're gonna to respond to a request for an accommodation? And um, you don't need to have all the answers. You need to be willing to find the answers. Because we don't know, we don't know what a kind of accommodations every single person will want. Everybody's different. And there's the note that accommodations enhance the experience for all. And on that note, Michelle, um, do you wanna talk at all about the um, accommodations that you make in your art studio and how maybe um, you've learned some things over the years on how you can try new things with the basic art supplies that you use? Yeah, um, a lot of times, I mean, like you've said, we've, we've just um, learned on the fly. Um, so we had a gentleman, um, he had very limited um, mobility with his arms and he wanted to paint and he wanted to paint with his hands and arms. Um, and so we um, took some basic gardening gloves and, um, you know, it was really quick, like, how do we get, how do we get him to be able to paint? And um, gardening gloves, cut off the fingers, um, did some hot glue Velcro to the top of each glove, added a slot to put the paint brushes in, glued it back down, and um, it gave, uh, you know, uh, PJ access to painting. And he actually enjoyed wearing the gloves um, and continued to um, paint um, many beautiful paintings. And um, we've, we've done things with, you know, taking, um, oh those large clips um and adjusting canvases you know just really just trying to figure out what is it that the person that we're working with needs in order to become their most independent um, um artistic self and um yeah so i mean it's it's sometimes taking a step back from what we think it should look like um, and really breaking um, breaking down each each portion of what it entails to actually do that um, that art project or art piece yeah that makes and sense. then yeah and then when when you start to incorporate new ideas like using clips to hold a canvas in place. I mean, that's something that anyone who's painting could benefit from that new idea that's come up. As a result of Correct. you making accommodations, now you have a new way to do art, whether that's an accommodation you need or not. Correct. Um, here's a question for my three panelists. Um, how, how, do we, how do people get started with accommodations? How do you know what accommodations to even prepare for when you're thinking about a new program or new offering to the public? I, I really, the, I think the first place to start is um, talking to uh, individuals with disabilities who, who need the accommodations to really find out um, what kind of services and supports would work best for them or what kind of accommodations or um, practice changes would be most beneficial. There's um, um, there, and I, I'm sure, and Chris can talk about this more, I'm sure, but, you know, there, um, the, the types of accommodations that people typically think of when, um, when, you know, they're, they're thinking of the ADA, 
uh, you know, it might be just providing Braille or providing um, an ASL interpreter or um, um, you know, things like that. Um, and it's not, it's not really always as simple as just going through the phone book and finding a, a provider or, or a vendor who's going to do those things for you. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's a kind of a broad spectrum um, when it comes to what people's needs and preferences are. And so it's, it's really important to, um, to talk to the ind individuals and learn, learn from them um, about what they've uh, found most useful in the past. And, and oftentimes people with disabilities who are requesting accommodations will work with you to identify um, kind of creative solutions and cost-effective solutions um, that, you know, works best for them and for you. You know, um, uh, there, there's definitely a, a spirit of, of cooperation there uh, that shouldn't be missed. Uh, I'll yeah. add on to that since Chad mentioned me by name. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so specifically with the getting started question. So I always, I always encourage people to embrace being proactive instead of reactive, instead of waiting for a request for an accommodation. Um, you can go to the ADA websites and there's all kinds of checklists that serve as kind of a baseline assessment. So really an assessment is the first step. So any of, any of you listening in or watching right now, and if you go, okay, well, what do I do first? Do an assessment. So you look at what are the programs that we offer? What are the spaces that we use? What kind of training do our staff have? And, you know, those checklists are really valuable. They're a good uh, jumping off point. You know, once you get through those and you've identified, oh, okay, you know what? This thing that we offered, that's really going to be a problem for people who don't hear. What can we do about that? It's at that point then, um, you know, again, following up with people in the community, like Chad said, uh, there's also, you know, the National Association for the Deaf. There's all kinds of organizations that uh, work with specific disability groups and they know more than most of us will ever know because it's their daily lives and their careers and advocacy uh, to think about uh, how to solve some of these uh, barriers to uh, positive engagement with the new organizations. So assessments and then follow up is, a good, is what I tell people to do when you're just getting started. Thank you. And Michelle already mentioned that she works individually with her clients to, to make the best accommodations for them. I think that's a really good point. And like I mentioned before as well, everyone's an individual and in in their needs. And the, because the disability can be intersectional, they might need you know, a different accommodation than the person before them with a similar disability needed. Um, here's another question. So, where do you all look for um, support or answers when it comes to making accommodations? So Chris and Chad and, and Michelle, please answer, but also anyone who wants to add to the chat box their favorite resources for ADA accommodations, go ahead. Sure, so um, with the Governor's Council for People with Disabilities, we we often uh, conduct uh, events and conferences and training sessions and um, provide supports to other organizations um, through our kind of a grant funded project. So it, it's, it's uh, pretty common that we're asked to provide accommodations or um, oftentimes we anticipate the need and, and we try to arrange those ahead of time. Yeah, um, you know, over time, you know, we, we kind of, we've created kind of a list of people that, that we've worked with um, that have been kind of reliable um, and, and quality providers of those services and supports but um, there's still you know there, there, there's still a lot to learn there, there's a lot of great resources on the internet um, from even event, event planning organizations um, national associations um, who have accessibility and meeting guides which we find uh, really useful um, those are frequently updated uh, in response to you know changes in um, the availability of assist, assistive technology or uh, just new ways of doing things. So um, it, it just, it's something that we still kind of have to kind of monitor and make sure that we stay abreast of, of uh, the best practices. Uh, 
I think Ste I think Stephanie left. I can I can keep to talk. Chris, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, so I'm in kind of a little bit different position, and it kind of gives an opportunity to bring up the idea of context in terms of who has a disability. So I'm a deaf history museum, but I grew up as a hearing person. So I actually work in an environment where like, I'm the one with a disability here and I have to figure out how I can communicate most effectively with everybody who comes to my museum because I don't have a natural fluency in sign language, although I do sign um, and I have physical disabilities. So it's difficult for me to use sign language. There's also people who are deaf blind and most of the things I have in a history museum, it's all photographs and documents and things that you have to read and look at. Um, and these are challenges that I've tried to address. Um, and it's been kind of a slow, you know, and being honest about the struggles that we have. I'm an army of one here and it's only a third of my job here at the school. So finding the time to figure out how to make all of this visual stuff accessible, especially as I'm building a digital archive online too. Is that stuff going to work with a screen reader though I have to change the format? Um, when I do have a deafblind visitor come in, there's a, you know, there's a few people who have been in a few different times and so I know when they come in we're a small community and I know immediately okay and I go approach and I say hi and anything I anything that I can safely pull out of a display case and let them touch, I do that. Even if, even if it's a little risky I still do that because I know that, you know, people who are blind are used to using their hands to um, to just understand their environment and then they're not, you know, clumsy and awkward and rough with things. So it's something that I might not ever let anybody else ever touch. I would probably let a deaf blind person do it because I know that they're not going to manhandle it, you know, it's and rough things up. So those are some things that, you know, considerations that I have going on in terms of changes I need to make here, and then some things that I've done to accommodate um, some of our visitors. Uh, I just want to kind of add on to that. I, uh, I, I, I was thinking of a recent trip I made, well not recent, it was last year, um, to the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. And the, um, you know, and I, I hadn't seen this before, but the, um, the museum had taken uh, some of his, his um, prints and had created 3D textural versions of them so that people um, who um, maybe had a visual impairment could, you know, tactfully feel those, that, that artwork. And I find my, I, I found myself being drawn to those um, kind of exhibits as well. And really, um, it kind of added to my experience. And then, and, 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 then, and so that just reminded me of, of saying that a lot of these accommodations uh, aren't only going to benefit people with disabilities. Um, quite frequently, they're going to benefit um, uh, if not the whole pot, you know, the whole um, participant uh, community, you know, uh, cer certainly um, you're going to find people um, beyond those specifically requesting those accommodations are going to appreciate them. Um, one, one quick example is uh, CART, um, which is uh, basically it's, it's that real time closed captioning that you might see at a live event where you've got a um, transcriptionist um, often a court reporter or someone trained in that, who will provide um, the the text of what's happening, and um, a lot of individuals, um, myself included, really um, rely on that um, it, 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 to 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 get the full experience. And that accommodation doesn't cost mu cost very much at all. And so I would really encourage um, organizations who have the budget to really think about that as being a standard offering. Um, even if it's not being requested from people who are registering. Thanks, Chad. Um, I have a couple more questions for the panel, but if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will get to those. Um, I have a question. I think it, it's for Chad, maybe Chris too. Uh, what if someone is worried about getting quote air quotes in trouble for not being accessible like uh is there an ada police or um <laughs> what should people be concerned about with the accessibility well um 
there, there's been a movement away from the the period of time when ADA, uh, ADA enforcement was was often considered litigious, where you, you see uh, where you saw just a lot of a lot of um, lawsuits and, and litigation. But but that that's still the primary way that the ADA is enforced. Um, the Department of Justice and the um, Civil Rights Commission, you know, have an active role in that. But um, the they, ADA violations are taken seriously by the government, and uh, you know, it can result in some some pretty hefty expenses and un unnecessary expenses. So, I, if you find yourself fearful that you're you're not um, meeting your accessibility requirements, um, I, I think the first thing that you should do is really do an assessment of of um, of your space and, and how you're offering your programs and try to identify those areas that you, you can improve on because it's certainly a lot better to do that um, uh, on your own before um, you've got you know civil enforcement which could require you to have to pay not only your attorney fees but the attorney fees of the individual bringing that complaint. Yeah, um, I'll add to that too again like uh, Obviously, you don't want to get sued, and that really uh, brings in the importance, like Chad said, of doing the assessment and having an access plan, having written documents, having it be part of your strategic plan. So, in the event that you do, quote, get in trouble, you have a defense saying, All right, you know, we know, and we're sorry, we're working on this, and it may make that process go a little more smoothly in terms of negotiating with. Um, you know, the parties involved whose, you know, rights that they feel have been infringed upon. Uh, it also really helps everybody stay organized and on track with timelines. So it's easy for everyone to say, oh yeah, I know we need to change this, but if it's not actually in your strategic plan, if there isn't somebody who's been assigned the accountability to make sure those changes happen, things get shoved to the back burner a lot. The smaller, especially like the smaller your organization, the fewer staff you have, the smaller your budget. There's, I'm, again, I'm a very small organization. I have like 90,000 projects, you know, like the to-do list that I just can't get to. When I mean, it's the kind of things I don't, I don't know if I'll ever get to them. And don't let accessibility keep getting shoved onto that back burner. Uh, make it part of your, your annual strategy and making sure that you're making some progress towards those goals. And then also looking at your, the demographics of your specific geographic region may help also. So you know, using the example of you know, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, like Indianapolis has a huge deaf community. So taking that, you know, communication and language access and, you know, putting it on the, to, you know, keeping it on the to-do list is probably a bad idea because there's a lot of deaf people here and there's more chances that, you know, somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna be, um, you know, really disappointed in a lack of access. Whereas you might be in a rural area. Yes, you do have to make accommodations if a deaf person wants to attend an event or do an activity but the chances of that happening are a lot less. So it's, you know, looking at who lives in your area, who visits your organization right now and focusing on those needs in terms of prioritizing your to-do list of, of making accessibility changes. Thank you, Chris. And I, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say that um, my advice, and I, I'm not a lawyer, please do not take this as legal advice, but you're not going to get in trouble for not providing an ASL interpreter at every single event, everything you do, plus you're not providing Braille. Plus, So it's not about having everything all the time. It's about not making an accommodation. So if someone comes to you and says, next week I have a ticket to visit your event and I need an ASL interpreter. If you say no to that, you're going to maybe be in trouble. But if you're willing to work with this person, um, you know, and it costs a couple hundred dollars to hire an ASL interpreter and you already have that budgeted, you are good to go. So that's kind of, I'm kind of saying what Chris was saying in a different way. Um, you need to be willing to make those accommodations. And if you're willing and, and you're following through on these requests for accommodations, you're going to be okay. Um, 
now if you want to be more inclusive that's a different thing and that's going a step further that is providing asl proactively without someone asking for it and advertising that to your community so that more people who are deaf or hard of hearing feel welcome to then come and buy that ticket so you've been proactive in that and you're creating an inclusive welcoming environment and that's you're never going to get in trouble for that that's just great business so we have a great question in the chat box um can uh, let's see can the panelists talk a little bit about how things have shifted since the pandemic uh like requests and accommodations in the virtual space i'd love to hear michelle's take on that and her work with her clients do you do online work um we have not shifted to online work. Um, more of my position went to delivering supplies to the homes and now um, bringing in small groups of folks, um, just kind of three to one, six to one, um, back into the art studio for just a couple hours um, since the pandemic has begun. Um, we have had some, um, community outings, um, just kind of small deliveries that we've had that I've um, picked up the artists and uh, they have gone along with me. Um, so yeah, we haven't gone to the online format with delivering the art um, pieces oh, has, yet. Has anything, yeah, has anything changed for you with social distancing and assisting someone to do what they need to do and like physical proximity. Um, yes and no. I mean, we, you know, we work with um, folks that um, a lot of them live uh, within our organization, um, whether it be a group home or apartment type setting. And so shifting from that you know, high five and the, um, you know, caring touch um, has changed for, you know, making sure they are safety as we leave and go out into the community and then come back to them. Um, and so that has been a little bit challenging just to remind folks um, that we are still here, even though we can't still offer that same level of um, touch um and so yeah it that that has been a little bit challenging i think for all for all of us great chris have you had any different experiences with everything going online um well our, our museum is closed so as a as as the staff person i don't really have any challenges um as a patron uh, who's hard of hearing masks are very difficult they're making my life difficult right now everywhere because i need to live for it um so in terms of providing service for people who are hard of hearing or deaf people who do live for it, uh you know clear face shields are fantastic <laughs> i like them a lot they make my life very easy um and you know kind of just keeping in mind that when people struggle to hear anyway the masks can make things really, really hard. And, you know, we want to keep everybody safe, but communicating that to maybe your staff. Um, and I also, it, it, it's a situation that hasn't come up yet, but I also wonder um, about, you know, mask policies. So if the policy is you have to wear a mask when you're inside the theater, inside the gallery, inside the studio, I need to lip read. So if I want to go anywhere with a friend, I can't have a conversation with them if we're both wearing masks. So is there any way to lift that policy and make it okay for my companion to not wear a mask so I can understand what they're saying if we don't have a clear face shield? So it's a little sticky situation with communicating uh, in terms of the masks and you know being on site in physical spaces. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback uh, Chris was saying. That, that's actually um, one of our biggest issues. Um, since the pandemic, 
we um, we've certainly found it a lot more difficult to to really meet the needs of individuals that, that we serve um, just because of, of um, lack of, of proximity and um, not having physical contact and those instances when that's really important for individuals. We have, uh, you know, we have board members that have um, a range of disabilities from um, from mild to um, to really significant. And uh, there's an individual that um, is on our board who's been, uh, he lives in a nursing home and he hasn't been able to um, participate in, in any of our virtual meetings because uh, just the technology doesn't work for him. And unfortunately, uh, we're, we're still working with him to try to find other solutions for him. Um, some assistive technology software, some training, um, uh, a laptop um, that he, he can, uh, we can loan to him. Um, but still, it's, it's not going to be the same. We're not going to, um, it's going to be, in, in, in all practicality, it's, it's, we're not going to be able to meet um, the needs of people in the way that we want to meet their needs um, at the moment. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, we're, we're still exploring solutions and trying to figure out what uh, other people are, are kind of discovering that works for them. Another, you know, Chris was talking about the mask issue. You know, so the ADA, um, you know, does say that if uh, if there's a um, a mask policy or mask regulation that uh, requires individuals to wear a mask in uh, public spaces or you know inside buildings, then um, individuals who who need an accommodation um, aren't entitled to essentially. Um, if you're in a situation like uh, what like uh, Chris is in, or if you um, uh, have an individual that perhaps has autism or uh, another type of like sensory um, uh, sensory disability, where it makes it difficult for them to, or oftentimes impossible to wear a mask, um, the the requirement is that that uh, you should try to you really need to find a way to still meet their needs needs absent um lifting the mask requirement if you can lift the mask requirement that's that's uh, that's uh for that individual that's absolutely what you should do and some organizations are setting aside hours uh you know at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day where they can um limit the number of people in the building and provide more opportunities to social distance um so there's so so the the access um the access um, effort is being um, really focused on program delivery. And so I, I, it's going to be really interesting to see what comes of that after um, hopefully this all is said and done. I want to ask our participants in the audience, have you started having these conversations about your facilities or your whatever location you might reopen at? And, um, how people with disabilities could interact with those policies that you're setting. Does anyone want to add thoughts? I know some people have theater venues. That's a very specific kind of location. Museums. This is dead air, but in education, it's called latency, and you wait for the students to answer. <laughs> okay, um, I have more questions. Let's talk about what are some common accommodations, or is there anything that you would list um, from your perspective, panelists, are more universal accommodations people can start to think about? So, so uh, can I, as I, I alluded to earlier, uh, if, if you're able to provide um, the, the CART, the, the um, real-time closed captioning uh, service for any live performances or uh, presentations, I, I think that you'll find that that's um, more of a universally welcomed um, accommodation that, um, like I said, benefits not just those who uh, who have hearing loss, but uh, and you know individuals who 
perhaps might have autism or are on the spectrum and or um, just people who just like to, you know, they, they just enjoy uh, reading along and it gives them kind of a better experience. And, and you'll find that that's, uh, again, that that's not a, um, a service that really does cost a whole lot. Additionally, um, providing, it, you know, if you, if you put anything on the website, so if, if you've got a presentation and, and you post it on YouTube or Facebook, um, if you can at all add transcriptions to that, um, you'll find that people really do uh, appreciate that as well. There's a lot of online services that will do that for you. Uh, and the cost is basically a dollar per minute. So um, again, it's, it's, you know, th those costs certainly add up for smaller organizations with a limited budget, but um, certainly if, if you can afford those, I think that's a really good place to start um, addressing some of the communication issues. Michelle, what are some common um, accommodations you're making? And um, do you want to, if you can add a little bit about cost too in that? Um, accommodations that we are making. You know, right now, um, we are, I don't, our organization, well, you, you talked, I think. You talked earlier about, you know, uh, changing the grips on paintbrushes and um, just rearranging how things are in your physical space so that the people can access what they need to at their, their right level or the, the way they want to approach it. Those are kind of common things for you, right? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I was talking to a couple of artists yesterday or two days ago. We were out doing a delivery and I was just asking them um, you know what are some things that um, trouble you when you're out in the community I mean um, with your uh, housemates and you know they're they gave pretty common um, I guess standard answers you know when people assume that they don't have the capability of understanding and talk to them as though, you know, they, um, they're not smart enough to get it. Um, or they're impatient with one of their housemates who, you know, she can't help um, the physical disability that she has or the noises that accompany her person um, and how people respond. And so, um, you know, and I think we mentioned just even, you know, the way people will speak to the other person versus the person that they're really supposed to be directing their thought process to. Um, so for me, a lot of accommodations at this time is just helping um, the community to understand that uh, the people that I'm with um, have their own mindset they're able to make their own decisions. Um, we just might have to slow down um, how much information we're giving them in order to give them enough time to process and make that decision. Um, so it's, it's things like that, you know, more of, you know, um, oh, that sweetheart child kind of language versus I'm actually speaking to another adult. You know, everyone here is over 18. So yeah. th that's, that's probably more of what I'm working with at this time um, as far as um, making sure their needs are being met when we're out in the community. Yeah, that's great. That, and that's something I really wanted to be mentioned. I'm glad you brought that up. So obviously free, the we talked about the um, behavior attitude barriers. That's what you're talking about. Making sure your um, yourself or your staff, if you have a bigger staff and you kind of have like a front of house uh, people who are customer service people, um, making sure they're prepared. Spending a staff meeting talking about um, how how to respectfully interact with people with disabilities. That is totally free and um, can get you way ahead on um, being inclusive and welcoming. 
Chris, do you have anything to add? Common accommodations? Yeah, I just, um, with, I, like the first step in accessibility, like I mentioned, was, you know, doing assessment, knowing, knowing where you're at. Uh, a big part of the service aspect of accessibility is letting people, being very clear about what accommodations you already have in place and uh, opportunities where you can be flexible in accommodation. So I'd like to really emphasize making sure that your website and your printed materials have that information. Um, as a visitor, as a potential patron to venues, I've hit a lot of frustrating walls over the years. I mean, I've had disabilities for 12 years now. And so I've hit walls where, okay, first step, go to the website. Do they even have, do they have ASL shows? And there's no information and there's no uh, contact information. If you have questions about accessibility, there's nothing. So then, you know, okay, well, I guess I'll send a contact us form. And then the person replies and says, oh, okay, well, I'll forward it to so-and-so. And so getting bounced around like that, when you could clearly put information and specific contact information for people on the website, it makes, it makes our lives easier <laughs> because, you know, it, it, these are, these are barriers that we hit every day. And, you know, generally you get used to it, but sometimes I'm just fed up and I've made decisions like I can't even deal with this and I'm not going there. And do you want that impression to be the lasting one? You know, do you want people to say, oh, this was so easy to find out what I can do there. They'll be more encouraged to try and contact you and figure out a way to bridge any gaps in your accessibility. So you want to have those positive experiences and not the frustrations. Um, that are often caused by lack of information. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we started at the IAC maybe a, maybe a year or so ago, probably with the advice of these people on this call that we started putting at the top, if you need accessibility, if you need other formats of this document, contact Stephanie Haynes. Um, and that's at the top of every document. That's a public document for us. And I think those little things you can start to do. I Jasmine's on this call. She knows she's our marketing person. I am constantly like, oh yeah, let's make sure we advertise we're, we're providing captioning for this. And so it is a, a process we're still working on, remembering how to let people know when we make, um, when we offer these sorts of things. And Thanks to the advisory committee, I am being more mindful and, um, and approaching these things with more thoughtfulness. And um, I applaud all of everyone who's here today for doing that as well. You know, you came to this session, you are thinking about these things, considering how you might eliminate barriers and be more inclusive. And so I applaud all of you for coming to this session. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Um, we are out of time. We could probably chat for a couple more hours, but um, thank you everyone for being here. And I have resources um, on our website. I was going to share my screen. So I have all these resources and these are all on the website. Does that look okay, Jasmine? Can you see the list of resources? Okay. These are all on our website. If you need to get checklists, if you need to look at the, there's one specifically from the NEA about cultural and arts things um, and accessibility. So I will um, send this out too. And we have all this on our website. So thank you everyone.